Hello, I'm Chris Lisher, and welcome to Turning of the Wheel, an intelligent, lively discussion on astrology, art, and adventure. Timing is everything, and as the great wheel turns, we are best prepared when we are best informed. Join me as I explore the current planetary alignments and offer insights for coping with change. Educational, informative, and enlightening, the turning of the wheel is a welcome pause in your daily swirl of constant change. Through intelligent discourse, inspired guests, and educational segments, I will help to enlighten your knowledge of astrology and guide you to accept change as the great wheel of life turns. Call in with your questions and speak with some of the greatest visionaries in the time-tested practice of astrology. Turning of the Wheel. Astrology, art, and adventure with Chris Flisher each week on Turning of the Wheel podcast. Hello and welcome to Turning of the Wheel. My name is Chris Flisher. As you know, this is a show about a lot of topics, and today we're going to be dipping into the world of quantum physics. And my guest today I've had on before, his book is titled The Everything Answer Book. His name is Amit Goswami, and I've had him on in the past. We were talking about the economics of happiness years ago, and it's great to have him back on the air to talk about his new book, The Everything Answer Book. Welcome to the show, Amit. Thank you. Well, we're glad to be here. Yes, yes. Well, listen, that's quite a large topic you have for a topic. You have the Everything Answer Book. How can you possibly answer everything? <laughs> Question. It's not me. It's the quantum worldview. Ah, I see. So quantum that's, physics is very powerful physics. Yes, and so it's more than just. I mean, when I think of physics or quantum physics, I think of um, I think of neutrons and protons and mole molecules and all sorts of matter. I guess I don't think of things in the in the realm of the mind or the the untouchable, the intangible, which is what is more of of the topic that you're talking about. You express a, an answer for love, death, and the meaning of life all within the quantum physics. I'm wondering how that works. Yes, that works very simply because uh, to understand quantum physics, we have to introduce consciousness into the worldview. Consciousness is the ground of being, not matter. Material possibilities and mental possibilities, they both belong to possibilities of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you have said that, then you can include matter and mind both under the same umbrella, consciousness. Uh, both are possibilities, quantum possibilities of consciousness. Consciousness chooses from them. And so quantum physics applies to both the realm of mind and matter. That makes the huge difference. So is, is you think that your view is that quantum physics is a uh, byproduct of the mind? Quantum physics, then, is a law that is designed by consciousness, for consciousness, and of consciousness. But isn't the mind a physical um, entity that has esoteric or unusual characteristics that we can't necessarily define? It seems to be sort of intangible. How does the, how does the physics uh, be, make that more tangible? Well, uh, the uh, physics does not necessarily make it more tangible. Because the tangibility, of course, is empirically what we find. Mind is about meaning. We process meaning with it. And we cannot really say that we can treat meaning mathematically, for example. But the idea that meaning has to be, mental meaning has to be quantum possibilities for consciousness to choose from does not depend on having, um, this, uh, having to discover mathematical equations of the mind. This idea that mathematics applies everywhere, that idea we have to let go. But the idea of quantum possibilities, that's independent of mathematics. How is it independent of mathematics? Is it because it's more of a mental uh, state? Yeah, but it's independent of mathematics in the sense that the physical principles may apply. Like Newtonian physics, we apply to um, many things. But can we write down mathematics for it? We cannot. Just because we are unable to write down mathematics for it does not make a physics non-applicable to something. I see. So in other words, by trying to force it to be more mechanical or mathematical, you are limiting your range of uh, perception. Right. That's an assumption that you have been making because you have been very successful making that assumption in the realm of inanimate matter. But we cannot really make that assumption for biological beings. We already know that. So this assumption, this very, very narrow and limiting assumption, we have to give up that the world is mathematical. The world is not mathematical. Clearly, the mental laws are different. They're so, like software laws. The software laws of the computer, we cannot 
we cannot uh, make them mathematical. They, have, they come from our mind. So um, hardware laws are different. Hardware laws are mathematical, but software laws uh, don't have to be mathematical, and they're obviously not mathematical. Otherwise, we would not have anything called freedom. Well, they're not mathematical uh, software. I understand your analogy with the computer. That's a good one. But I'm wondering um, if they're not mathematical, they are at least founded and, and uh, is, their foundation of them is mathematical. Um, when you're writing software, you're talking about writing a code that speaks to a mathematical instruction you, and that you, brings you, about the, uh, the, uh, the end result. You make a representation of the meaning, and once you make the representation, then you can uh, apply certain laws of algorithm, etc. That's true. And the same thing applies to mind. Once we have it in the brain, mapped in the brain, then the brain follows certain algorithmic rules to that part of the mind, which um, uh, con which consists of uh, consists of uh, recalling old memories. But for new part of the mind that we constantly generate also with our creativity, no algorithm can be applied. And that's what I mean by giving up the limit of mathematics. Yeah, I, I'm still stuck on that, though. <laughs> and that's a tough concept to get my head around. Um, Absolutely. Simply because of the fact that I think that I, I'm, I'm tending to think that as we move forward in evolution, that we would become more and more um, mechanical. And as we discover more about the mind, we're able to address more topics uh, mechanically. We can address them and repair them mechanically. You know, as we enter into the world of robotics, for example, we're getting closer and closer to artificial intelligence, which can actually be greater than human intelligence. I think you have to give up this idea. <laughs> no, really. If you have quantum worldview, we have to give up this idea. So you all uh, at one point thought that we are mechanical and therefore the world more and more will be replaced by mechanical robots and human beings become superfluous. Many people think that way today. But that idea has to be just given up because the human creativity obviously is what creates all this mechanical stuff. And human creativity can, it cannot be formulated as mechanical. No, it is. Creativity by definition is something that is beyond mechanics. Once we accept the fact that creativity is what changes our society changes us, makes life worthwhile, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. then we give up on mathematics. No, I mean, meaning itself is a good example. Meaning is not computable. No, nobody has been able to make a computer which can process meaning directly. We make representations of meaning with symbols, and then we can carry on uh, symbol processing symbols through algorithms. That's fine. But that's the level of representation. We cannot, computers cannot process meaning itself, as uh, Roger Penrose mathematically has proven using Godel's theorem. Mm -hmm. And the idea is so simple. You know, John Sell gave that idea 10 years before Penrose uh, figured out the mathematics, uh, simply by showing or just arguing, basically. Simply this, that um, if you make... Uh, symbol processing machines, and let's say we make, keep some symbols for processing meaning symbols. And then we need more machines to process the meaning of the meaning symbols. Because remember, we have to do it from scratch. Mm -hmm. How we do it with dictionaries, because we know different words for the same uh, meaning, and so somehow we convey it to each other because we know a lot about from the culture and we manage with the dictionary. But well, if you have to make a dictionary from scratch, you need infinite dictionaries. It's as simple as argument uh, as that. Well, I think, that, I think the dictionary serves as, it's more of like a contract between two people saying, yes, we agree that this is what we're defining. This is what an apple is. We know that this is the definition of an apple or whatever, or a tree or whatever you want to choose. Exactly right. And that's what they, if you were doing it from scratch, that's what you don't have. And therefore, computers cannot process meaning. If there is no way of processing, because if you want to use symbols, then you have to have, again, not infinite, a symbol for symbol processing for meaning and the meaning of the meaning symbols, meaning of the meaning of the meaning symbols, that infinite. Right, right, right. You right. can never process yeah. how, from how do you define meaning? Meaning is something which is really, again, just uh, obvious, um, self-explanatory. We cannot really even define it. We know that it's different from syntax, the grammatical rules of a sentence. 
But what the sentence is covering, that meaning is inside of us. So it, 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 that shows you how difficult it is to process meaning. For do, you, do you think that meaning is the same for all people? No, they're different for different people. That's the whole problem arises. No, right now we are having comp complete cognitive dissonance between two political parties in many, many countries. Yours and mine. So, you know, it's a huge problem. Right? So, so the, that definition of meaning is not universal. Um, no. I suppose it, in some ways it is. We can all agree that a tree is a tree. Uh, that's, that's the definition. But, but that requires us to have a... Uh, uh, a joint set of expectations and a visualization of what we think a tree is. So two people can agree on that. And for tree, at least, there is um, good reason to expect an agreement. But there are ambiguous things for which we cannot even agree. Uh, you know, the point that the investors often make, they will hold, a, hold up a microphone in their hand and then they will ask, what is it? If you say it's a microphone, they will say, I'll hit you with it. What do they mean? They mean that it can also be used as a hammer. If, no, if, a if you are attacked by a bandit, you have nothing but a microphone, you can defend yourself with it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, you got me there. That's a good example. Uh, that's a good example. I mean, you, you can change the uh, use of something. Um, I mean, you can burn a piece of firewood. You can build a house with a piece of firewood. Um, uh -huh. You know, there are different meanings for it. You can, uh, you can use a piece of wood as a hammer, too. You can... So there is no one-to-one -one correspondence become between the physical object and the mental meaning we give it. It mm -hmm. depends on the circumstances. Yeah. Mm. You know, but the thing is that, um, you know, we tend to think of quantum as, at least I do as a layperson, um, something that is deeply scientific, and yet you're bringing it into the realm of consciousness, which to me seems... Um, at odds in some way because they one seems very mechanical and one seems very esoteric and uh, um, intangible. So where you're bringing those two together, you think that this is a, a matter of consciousness and how do you achieve consciousness? Well, quantum physics forces it upon us. Uh, this is the uh, point, Chris. Look, uh, quantum physics says objects are possibilities. See, uh, already intangible. Possibility is not tangible. Infinite possibility is not tangible. So um, this idea that consciousness is intangible and therefore uh, should not come into the matter of tangible is already per se because um, quantum physics forces upon us the idea that everything is possibility, not really this tangible object, this hard matter that we think, you know, solid tables, chairs, no, it's not like that. It's the interaction of consciousness with the possibility of a chair that's making the solid chair. Not before consciousness enters the picture. Without consciousness, everything is just possibility. There is no manifest world. This is what quantum physics says. And absolutely stubbornly says. Stubbornly says. So without, without consciousness, there is nothing? There is nothing. There is only possibility of something, but there is nothing. No thing. Do you believe that anything is possible? Well, anything is possible within the physical laws that consciousness has. Consciousness has certain limits that imposes upon itself. All possibilities would be um, impossible to manifest because everything is included already. So you have to have some limits. So limits are physical laws, mental meaning, uh, vital mm, blueprints. These are the limits within which consciousness uh, manifest itself. It so it's really itself. about perception, is what you're coming down to. It's really about how we perceive, right, how we experience. It's so, really about our experience. Science is a science of experience. So we, our, our sensors, our sensors, our eyes, which, which review this, which we see through these, uh, these are our receptors, our eyes, and we look into the world and we see something, and our perception of that forms our definition of it, and if you look at the same thing, you should see the same thing, theoretically, right? Well, um, yes and no. You have a, your perspective. But don't forget the other aspects of uh, art that we just discussed. You know, the material part, I see that. But we also have the mental part, vital energy part. So we, we are, you know, not everything is sensory. Mm -hmm. Sensory is just the physical part. And then we have mental thinking and vital feeling. 
even in Asian. Yeah, I understand that. The um, so we are far more than just a physical body, is what you're saying. <laughs> I mean, obviously that's true. We have uh, um, our our personalities. We have our way we perceive things. The way our brain works. Do you do you think that quantum physics can um, repair people? Well, quantum physics certainly can repair the mental and vital part. This is why quantum medicine is becoming so popular. The alternative years, you know, the, um, all the traditional Chinese, uh, Indian, our Veda, they talk about um, vital body medicine, energy medicine. Right. Do you think that... Um that quantum physics could re restore memory in a human being? Well, by creating the, the blueprints are already there. Memory is the memory of the mind. No, we, we don't memorize just physical events. We also yeah. memorize the uh, mind. So with the help of the mind, we might be able to restore the physical memory because every physical memory has a correlated mental meaning. Associated with it. So, by, by cultivating, the, you're thinking of Alzheimer, obviously, by cultivating mind, we may be able to heal Alzheimer's. Right, right. I, I, it, it seems as if, uh, because you, know, you think of the idea of if the mind is like a computer hard drive, everything that is seen or used or, or, or in, placed on, written to that hard drive, would be there always and would always remain. So that, that, there's a mechanical process happening there. Brain is the hard drive, and mind is the software over it. So the, the way to think of it is that there is this little engrams in the brain. If you excite them, then there is mental meaning correlated with it. And the mental meaning is automatically played, so we take it for granted. But the, but the mind really is a separate entity, separate world. It's just correlated with the help of consciousness with the brain piece of memory. Mm -hmm. So the memory really is not in the brain, just in the brain. There is brain part of it, but that's a very little part. That has no mental stuff associated with it per se. Only because the mind is correlated with it, as soon as you have ticked the uh, brain part, the mental part is automatically experienced. So if you take this idea, then what happens is that the whole uh, retrieval um, gets a boost because otherwise it's a mystery how we retrieve any memory. Not only Alzheimer's patients who cannot retrieve, but even ordinary people, how do you retrieve? You know, for a computer it's simple. You push a button, memory comes. But uh, there is no button to push for a brain. How do we retrieve memory at all? This is a complete mystery in, in a computer physical model. But with the mind, we very simply recognize that all we have to do is to make a uh, wish, make an intention, and consciousness cooperates because everything is potentiality for consciousness to choose from. And the potentialities are constantly being given by the brain. This, you know, that's the nature of the brain. And so the, the, this potentiality, as soon as consciousness recognizes, immediately the mental part will be played with it. So retrieval becomes a very simple thing to understand. But you have to be—you have to be a conscious person to begin with, in order for this to, operation to happen, right? Absolutely. You have to be a conscious person. You have to be a human person. This and way, this way, our memory was not going to work for a computer. No. Is it, is it is it is gaining consciousness a difficult task for people? Do you think? I mean, are, are, are do you think the average person is conscious? Well, automatically there is a part of uh, conditioned consciousness that even the average person has. It's a creative part of consciousness, creative aspect of consciousness, I should say, that is difficult to, because most people forget it. Everybody is creative in the childhood. But, you know, because of uh, wrong growing up and uh, bad situations of life, People uh, get into uh, a very conditioned existence, in which case they were right. They become like very mechanical. Mm -hmm. But you th you'd think that if, there, if this was something that could be universally applied and used, we could actually bring peace to the world because we could alter consciousness to the place where people were, began to have the same perception and got along as opposed to this. Or is this a part of the natural um, duality of life that has to have a yin and a yang in order for things to work. There has to be a negative and a positive in order for the world to operate, in order for there to be motion, in order for there to be 
action. Well, it, yin and yang should not be thought of negative and positive. Instead, just think of them as conditioning and creativity. Yin is conditioning, yang is creativity or um, manifest and uh, manifest potentiality. If you think that way, then you see that both are necessary. Uh, both are necessary because the conditioning gives you the expertise. Don't forget that. And the um, creative gives you the new ideas. So just new idea alone is not enough because the idea has to be put in a form. And that form requires conditioning. So both parts, yin and yang, are essential components of the human being. Mm -hmm. So that would, but I mean, if do you think that the world is a dual, a dualistic structure where you have these opposing uh, energy forms that create this momentum in that we get, that is the sort of the birth of all things, where there is this swirl of activity that has to happen because at its core, that seems to be what the basis of the universe is—is is that sort of the positive that those, those two qualities, right? Well. Um, but the universe is not out there permanently. I mean, it being momentarily created through our experiences. If you superimpose that idea, then yes. I mean, the point is that, that once the laws get going in the universe, then there is a certain amount of fixity that automatically comes in. We can count on it. Because continuously, the manifest, that which has been manifested that the probability of that coming up again and again would always be wonderfully good. And therefore, we never have to um, worry that I go to sleep and the will the world be there. No, the world will be there because we have already experienced the world that way many, many, many times. So it's already conditioned to be there. The laws make sure of that or conditioning make sure of that. So there is no risk of losing it just because it's being, in a way, created every time we are experiencing something. But uh, what we experience uh, is the same thing, no, mostly. And then once in a while, a creative little thing, uh, something new comes. So it, it's a nice, nice way of experiencing the world. And the more creative you are, the creative part increases in proportion, and the more you are happy. Because mm -hmm. creative part is what gives us joy, happiness, etc. But the conditioned part is not to be disregarded. Without conditioning, how could we go to the bathroom? This is why there's the famous Zen Koan. How does the Zen master go to the bathroom? Just because they were enlightened, you still have to go to the bathroom. So there is no total freedom so long as we are in the body, so long as we are in the world. So do you think that the mind exists, out, I mean, the mind exists independently of the body in that regard? I mean, and all that we know and do and say is simply a vehicle of our conditioning, which is learned over the course of our lives. We learned that we have to get up in the morning. We learned to go, to, like you say, go to the bathroom. We learned all these things. Um, we cannot avoid that. That's part of our conditioning. Right. And so the mind, it, but you can also, can, can, but then we could also condition the mind to do other things as well, couldn't we? Yeah. We can do, and we do, that civilization, right? We, we uh, were at some point of our history, hunters and gatherers, but now look at how many wonderful things we can do. We can still be hunters and gatherers if we want. We sometimes do go to our backyard and gather, but that does not limit our availability of potentiality. We have now... Uh, manifested much more potentiality than the hunters or gatherers ever could. Uh, and my sus supposition is that we have so much more, you know, infinite potentiality, literally. And, um, you know, we haven't even talked about intuitions and archetypes. These things are still not directly manifestable in the human body. We can only manifest mental meaning. We can only make uh, the meaning of things like love, beauty, you know, the archetypes, only with our mind and our feelings. We cannot manifest them directly and memorize them. So therefore, uh, there you go. The evolution can go on uh, in directions that we even don't know how that will go. How do you, how do you explain intuition, as you mentioned? Uh, that is, a, is that a perceived... Uh, uh, answer to something that we have uh, sort of put together based on our experiences or some of those things are just magical. You have intuitive moments, right, where you just happen to know something and you can't quite explain it. Is that based on experiences that have been, uh, you know, a a a acquired over the course of a life? 
actually, actually it, it can be cultivated, but the, the intuitions are always giving us a hint of something new. The archetypes are, remember, archetypes cannot be made, represented as of yet in the human body. There is no neo-neocortex which can make a representation of the archetype. That's why I ask you, what is love? Your answer will not be the, ever be the same as mine. Or if I say, how did you experience love when you fell in love in your youth? Um, yes, you experienced some heart throb and some tingles in the heart, but and I did too, but the experience would not be the same, no? Because we made a representation of love in our body and experienced it. We made a representation of love in our mind and we experienced it. And your experience will never be the same because it's a representation. Neither of us are, are, have the capacity of making a direct memory of something. Mm -hmm. So it, it's like, can we ever get the same picture of the banana if um, we have never eaten it? We can't. So it's just concept and with just feelings. You know, how does a banana feel? How does a banana? How can we give meaning to a banana? That's all we can do. We don't know what a, what a, what real love as a quantity. What is that? We don't know that yet because we cannot make direct representation of it. That capacity will have to come, and we have to evolve further. That's what uh, any um, reasonable evolution theory tells us, and and that is what. Uh, evolution of consciousness demands. So there is much to evolve for. Not only the world is not jaded, it's not about to be jaded in a long, long, long time. So do you see a, a, a benefit to people becoming more conscious in themselves? Would that lead to an end that's desirable for all humanity? I think that, um, first of all, it's desirable for the particular human who is doing it. I think that the more we become creative, the more doors open towards happiness. Look at ordinary people's happiness is just ordinary physical things that are built into the body. We can have sex, we can eat, we can sleep. Basically, uh, these few things we can do and that gives us pleasure. We have pleasure circuits, but there is also many negative emotional circuits which makes, gives us pain. So this is the life we can live. I mean, this is this everybody is entitled to. But now we bring in the idea of creativity. And what happens? Immediately we can process meaning. Before we could process only old meaning, other people's meaning. But as soon as you discover that, no, you can give meaning yourself. You have the right to give meaning in addition to what other people have been telling you. And then a new world opens up. What happens with the discovery of printing press? People all of a sudden found that, oh, people think this way, but I can think by combining that, I can make my old, uh, new meaning, which is even better than the old meanings I'm reading. And a new civilization practically took off. Uh, we can do the same kind of thing now with feelings, because we are just opening up to the world of feelings. It's no longer just a woman's world, a lesser world, but men are discovering feeling. And this is a very good thing. And then intuition, people are, creative people have already always more or less um, dealt with it, but ordinary people couldn't because they didn't know the creative process, nobody did. Now we do, and therefore many more people are creative. Have you noticed the creativity explosion in some areas? We certainly um, have enormous potentiality for creativity to explode in ordinary people's life. So you know, these things then um, uh, become more and more happiness producing. This is the thing. In creativity, we have something called flow. This uh, yang part and yin part, they flow with each other when we create a product. And this is just so joyful. I mean, why do you do what you do? Like we are talking, but at some point the conversation becomes such a flow and we enjoy it. We say, Oh, this was great, Chris. Talking to is just so much more fun. But it becomes fun because it was that that flow. Creativity just flew, and that our both of our abilities, the young ability and inability, cooperated perfectly. And it can only happen in a moment of time. We can't. Uh, we might. We might have another discussion some other time. Might not have that flow. Correct. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then we are a little frustrated, but we don't let go. 
<laughs> we try again next time and it happens. Right, right. Yeah. We are talking today with Amit Goswami. He is the author of the Everything Answer book, How Quantum Science Explains Love, Death, and the Meaning of Life. Big, big topic. We'll take a quick break here. We'll be right back, and we're going to discuss some of those love, death, and life questions, because i got some for you there, so hang on. <laughs> what is your destiny? Where are you going? What is your real purpose? Do you know? Do you want to know? Of course you do. It's your duty to yourself. We are all here for a reason, and we all have great potential. Discover all of this and more with a professional astrology reading. My name is Chris Fisher, and I can help you. Discover your strengths and work on your weaknesses and live your life to its fullest capacity. Based on your birthday, birthplace, and birth time, an authentic astrology reading will allow you to live your life to the fullest and reveal your true purpose. Only real astrology can give you real information. It is your destiny, and it is your path. Write me at chris at chrisflisher.com and book a reading today. Or call me at 978-393-1036. That's 978-393-1036. www.chrisflisher.com. Astrology is the science of spirit, and it can serve as an invaluable aid in making the difficult choices in life and seeking truth in all the directions we choose. It holds the potential to allow each of us to evolve to our highest potential. It is the logic of the universe, the code of existence, and the pathway to true wisdom. It is our duty to draw from it the instructions for our lives and to live them to our fullest potential. As the great wheel turns, we are best prepared when we are best informed. As the world shrinks and our barriers come down, diverse cultures are striving for harmony, balance, and peace. To ease the transition, we need to expand with color, light, and tolerance. Now, you can become a global citizen and embrace the color and clear spirit with the divine artwork of the mandala. Mandalas are a timeless artistic offering for creating unity, harmony, and peace. My name is Chris Fisher, and I've spent years creating mandalas, and they are now available online at www.turningofthewheel.com. Come and experience the world of color, form, and function with t-shirts, coffee mugs, note cards, and limited edition prints. These vibrant, lively paintings and products express optimism, oneness, and spiritual balance for all who use them www.turningofthewheel.com That's www.turningofthewheel.com And enter a world of possibility and color. Okay, welcome back to Turning of the Wheel. My guest today is Amit Goswami. He is a doctor of quantum physics and he's written the Everything Answer book, which sounds like a very large and ominous title, but it says how quantum science explains love, death, and the meaning of life. So, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to read the book. I, no. I know that, but there's got to be more to it than that. I, I, meaning of life is in the title, so I better, better answer the question. Mm -hmm. So, what is the meaning of life? It depends on the person. Um, the more the thesis, basically, that quantum physics gives us, that life is a pursuit of new meaning, and of course we can uh, leave old meanings that traditions give us, um, culture give us, society give us. Uh, that's one set of meaning. Like, uh, you know, I live in America where there is one meaning that everybody would like to have. It's called the American dream. And for some people, it's a fixed American dream. So American dream means that you grow up, uh, you go to school, you get a good job, you get a good wife for a man. I mean, you don't talk about women in America very much. I mean, now it's changing a little bit. Um, and uh, you are mobile in life. That's the part that is the American dream. You have mobility, you can go up. If you work hard enough, you are rewarded and you can go up and up and up. There's no limit to that. That's the American dream. But it's completely defined in material terms. So if this becomes a fixed dream, then obviously that fixed dream will not be fulfilled after a while because the material prosperity cannot grow as uh, demanded by this sort of dream if it is fixed. So America is having a lot of problem 
maintaining its so-called Americana. It's losing its American dream. It's obvious. So that, therefore, it's doing crazy things like, you know, we're electing a leader who has no idea how to run a country. That's fine. Um, it has to find its way. But the way ultimately is what? Ultimately is that you have to change the meaning of your life. The meaning cannot be fixed. If it is a fixed thing, then of course quantum physics would have nothing to say. What is quantum physics as opposed to Newtonian physics? Newtonian physics says everything is fixed, determined. It is this way. Quantum physics says no, everything is potentiality. There is infinite potentiality for us to live. We have only lived a portion of it. So we have new potentiality ahead of us and we can discover new meanings of life and this is the progress that we make. Life is fundamentally a question of progressivity and keep it in check sometimes. So conservatives are not ruled out, but the progressivity is what must happen in order for life to be happy. Meaning of life question, of course, is that if I find my meaning, then should I be happy? Yes, you should be happy. And if, it's, if you're not happy, that means that you are not cultivating the meaning of life properly. You are not exploring the meanings that are available to you. Why do you think that people have such a hard time with discovering this? Is this, is this? Does this require an effort on their part that they're not willing to expend? I think that they're having unprecedented difficulty today because we live in a culture in which scientific materialism, this very narrow philosophy that everything is matter, has entered in a very, very definite way in people's life. It is being imposed by the media, basically. What uh, media has done, it has changed the meaning culture into an information culture. Because in scientific materialism, things are all matter. Matter cannot process meaning. Matter processes information. So the idea that everything is information has grown in the last 20, 30 years, just enormously. Look at the internet today, uh, you'll find an information culture. Everything is information. You just look it up. You don't think about it. You don't cultivate it in your own mind. You have, we have forgotten that. Everything is in the internet. You just look it up. Every meaning you are looking for, you just look it up. Look at it. Consult the internet. That's the wisdom that is given. Information. Everything is available as information. You don't have to know anything. You don't have to know how to cultivate meaning yourself. It's all available at the push of a button. This idea is killing the culture. So people have stopped being creative. Creativity is discovery of new meaning, that ability that I can construct my meaning with, a more, with my own mind, and I don't have to depend on, uh, you know, all this fake news that people are pushing at me with the Internet. Um, uh, this is the problem. Wow. So it, it, does that not bode well for, for humanity going forward? If we are becoming more and more dependent upon this information that you mentioned, we're, we're not getting away from it. We're not raising our consciousness. We're getting deeper into it, into the information that you mentioned. We are getting, making ourselves a hole to get into the mud and the slime and the gutter, uh, whatever you want to call it. What will, yeah. what will, what will bring that up? What will change that? How, how would we change that? How could we change that? It is all ultimately movement of consciousness. So I'm not worried about it. How we change it is through creativity. And, you know, I have a immediately uh, immediate uh, goal is to establish the quantum worldview. Right now, we are very torn between the old feudal, feudalistic Christian worldview versus the scientific materialist worldview. And those two worldviews, both are very incomplete. Both are old-fashioned in the sense that not progressive. They are all both um, very, very limited to what is already known. Be culture cannot be based on the known. It has to have a modicum of unknown into it by the, the, on the olden days, the creative people used to contribute that. Uh, you have a long history in England for that kind of thing. You remember romantic poets? They were really a huge force for social change, weren't they? But that was the 18th century. 19th century, gradually things became more scientific and more technological, and the technological people gradually gained their upper hands. And now people hardly talk about poetry, arts, humanities, let alone spirituality. So the sources where new meaning comes into the society, they are very dried up. Except for technology, no new meaning is virtually allowed to enter the culture. This is a huge problem. 
quantum physics says that, look, it does not have to be this way. We have discovered the creative process. Now everybody can be creative. And we have discovered that meaning is essential to introduce into the world. Mind is independent of matter. We have discovered that even archetypes make sense. And therefore, let's go back to the way the society was in some respect, not uh, recreate the old society necessarily, but the, um, we don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's what we have done. Let's restore the baby and uh, grow it. And that baby is intuitions, the archetypes, mental meaning. These are the kind of thing, feeling. Um, these are the kind of thing that we want to cultivate more and more. And it's a good thing that, you know, women will be with us today, uh, thanks to certain progress that women folk have made. So women already have a strength in feelings, and that gives them a special access to intuition. So I think men and women working together, um, uh, great progress can be achieved. So my solution is quantum activism. Just get to the quantum worldview as soon as you can, because it integrates the two old worldview and takes us to newer frontiers much more quickly. Well, if we look back at history, we saw many big uh, changes in history. Like when the Industrial Revolution happened, we thought that was the end of the farm. And in some ways, I suppose it was. But when we look at the, inf we're now in the information age. And so humanity, as it has evolved over the course of history, has always adapted and moved on and progressed. And we're here because of creativity. We are here at this point in time. You and I are talking via this phone call because of creativity, right? That is a mathematical creativity. It may be an engineer that created it, but it is a creative process, right? Well, um, it, it, it's creativity and it's not mathematical. So be a little careful with, with the language. Okay. It's not mathematical and that's good. It, it will be on the, in fact, most unmathematical ever because now the creativity will be more directed towards these archetypes. Because look, uh, Abraham Maslow uh, discovered this in the 60s, long time ago, but we are hearing the message only right now. We talked about this last year when you invited me to talk about uh, spiritual economics, quantum economics. So the hierarchy of needs, basic needs are now accomplished. We now, you know, in countries right. okay. that we live, we don't have to worry about survival needs. So we are coveting, you know, the American kids today, they're not satisfied with information processing. They want mental meaning. And this is why, you know, we, we had so many people in America, it's unthinkable, but people supported socialism in the last election cycle. It's very unfortunate that the uh, conservative faction of the Democratic Party had their candidate and she won. But the fact is that uh, the hard candidate was a socialist. And what does that mean? That means that youth of this country, at least, is absolutely running wild for new meaning in their life. They are not happy with the information culture. So what will happen? They will wake up to the quantum worldview. They will discover that they have the potentiality and they have the ability, capacity to uh, actualize those potentialities in their very life, in their very lifetime, within just the next few decades. So the world will be a very different world, Chris. I'm convinced of it in right. just a matter of decades. I think it's a matter of survival as well. When you refer to the, um, the concept of death, we all know that death is an inevitable. Um, do you think that, the, that this process, or your possibility, your way of thinking is a... Um, do, we re, do we reincarnate after we have a death? Do we come back as a new entity? Are we a continuous strain, as you mentioned? Yeah, I think that the, the best part of the quantum worldview is the concept of non-locality. This idea that there is a domain of potentiality in which communication is instantaneous and it's not uh, limited by the rules of the manifest domain of reality. So what happens is that part of the memory that we create, memory of what we learn, actually is not stored in the brain where things are perishable, entropy law but stored in the non-local domain of reality, the domain of potentiality. So in that domain, nothing perishes. So what happens is that everything is forever. Therefore, we can have a string of pearl kind of existence where we become one particular manifest pearl and then we die. And then we are born again in another time and place. But the something from now will continue in that life. In, in What continues? The, the character that I developed, the, the, the kind of 
expertise that I developed. So if I develop the capacity to love, that will be continuing in my being in the next life. Now this gives so much credence to the human journey because otherwise you are constantly baffled. That's all, so much to learn and so little time to learn. You know, art is long, life is short, you have heard that. But we no longer have to worry, life is not short. This life is short because this life does become jaded. The body is subject to entropy law and therefore we cannot continue this body forever. Um, and why should we? Because next life is waiting, new body, new society, new culture, new everything, new meaning to explore. So if, if a, a baby is born, do you think the baby comes in with a preset of, of rule of like a software uh, uh, operating system? Potentiality, there's no question about it. If the mothers are not jaded, if the mothers are really creative mothers, they can incite a lot of qualities that the baby has in potentiality. It's not an empty slate. It's a very much a, um, a slate which is full of potentialities that can be activated by supplying the baby suitable stimuli. The, uh, of course, unfortunate thing sometimes happen is that the mothers don't pay attention, the baby grows up in the hands of servants who don't know enough, so some of these potentialities will never be triggered. They have to be triggered. But wouldn't you think that we have a, a preset of uh, a preloaded we come preloaded with characteristic attributes, talents, even perceptions, I imagine, that we would recognize, meaning that a baby born in 1900 would have a different set of, 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 of knowledge than a baby born in the year 2000, right? Because what? society and, and technology and humanity has evolved in that hundred years, they would come in with more information already there, right? Or would that be the accumulation of a series of lives? Well, it, 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 they, it's a little bit tricky than that because, they, you know, in quantum physics, all is potentiality, so they have to be triggered. So it's, it's not already pre-wired. Uh, even the genetic conditioning, as you know, there are potentialities mostly. There is a predisposition. So babies will have a predisposition towards becoming a musician, towards being creative, towards being a mathematician. But that predisposition has to be triggered by some events. And this is where the mother comes in, this is where the parents come in, this is where the teachers come in. So you have to create a variety of triggers for the kid. So the potentiality, the potential is there. Yeah, potential is there. Potential, but potential is much more because there, there, is a, a, there are potentialities which are vaguely present, which I have to learn and then trigger. Potentialities which are already learned, which are already available to me with just a little less, little less stuff push. This is why it is so important, you know, child psychologists are constantly emphasizing how important it is to grow a child with a variety of stimuli, variety of uh, intelligence stimuli. You know, this idea that there are multiple intelligences for us to uh, actualize. This idea is really revolutionizing how to rear a child because we just don't make it you know, just that mechanical stuff, but also mathematical stuff, musical stuff, feeling stuff, so many stuff we can, we can trigger in them by just ava making available a whole bunch of experiences other than just the fixity of one type of experience. Do you think all. we all have the same potential? Uh, potentiality in principle, yes, but again, this learning, uh, learned uh, people who have learned before, uh, have many incarnations before, they obviously have an advantage. So, yes and no. Yes, in principle, but in practice, uh, people do come with more learning. Right, but, right. But, but again, this is okay, because as we learn more, we become more compassionate to our fellow human being. So, it don't produce a hierarchy. Parents don't feel hierarchically superior to their children. So, the old souls are very sympathetic to the plight of the new souls. Mm. And, and usually, they're always sympathetic. And you think that uh, things, uh, human characteristics such as racism and hatred and violence are, are also learned? They're learned and they are unfortunately part of the gene pool. And this is what the problem arises. Our brains are built with them. And no brain is an exception. Every brain including the brain of our great teachers, you know, Mahatma Gandhi or Jesus Christ or Mother Teresa, 
everybody has those negative emotional brain circuits to deal with. And we have to deal with them if we, in addition, have positive emotional brain circuit from our reincarnational expertise, that's wonderful. If we don't, we, the society has to uh, encourage uh, people that live in the society to develop this positive emotional brain circuit. This is why a society which only promotes violence, a society which only promotes dominance, one-upmanship, that society is bound to perish. Those societies will not last. They will have too much war, too many fights, and, and society cannot grow in those conditions. Mm -hmm. So a peaceful society requires that the violent tendencies in our negative emotional brain circuits must be balanced by tendencies of positive emotions that we have to create. If we have not created in our past incarnations, you have to create in this incarnation. Society must be make that creation available to its citizens. You know, if everything is, if we are all a composite and life is a composite of, of pluses and minuses, as I referred to earlier, maybe you differ with that, but there is, you can't have uh, the sun without the rain, you can't have the light without the dark, you have to have them for contrast. So do you think that as a result of that, we are always going to have a parallel or this diametrically opposed ideas that keep the churn going, you know, the good versus the evil, that whole thing, is that always going to be, is that a perpetual motion? I think a little bit differently. I mean, I agree that right now we are stuck with our mind. So long as it's a mental um, age that we are living, especially the uh, rational mind, which indeed makes this balance. And indeed, if you look at creativity, it is true, Chris. So I sort of agree with you. If you look at creativity, the negative is helpful. The negation and... Uh, position that you have and its negation, if both are allowed in the unconscious, then they can mix and make many, many, many new possibilities that would not be possible to make with just positive or just negative. So this negative and positive, positive combination is a wonderful combination for creativity. So for, for mind to function, this is a good thing to have. But remember, our future is in the archetype. So as the archetypes more and more govern our human condition, then things can change in an unprecedented way. And we may not need this evil to, to balance the progress of the good. Evil just acts as a sort of a break on the progress of the good. Um, uh, we may not need the break um, at certain point is what I'm saying. Well, when you, when you, when you talk about archetypes, you're referring to the classical archetypes that we've that always seem to be part of human human existence since time the began. Platonic, platonic archetypes, yeah, like good, beauty, justice, uh, truth, standards, Love. and those continue on ad infinitum, and they always will. But you think that we are not as in tune with them as we should be, and that by uh, delving deeper or raising our consciousness, we would be more apprised of them or more aware of them. Yeah, we, we have even forgotten some of them. For example, archetype of truth is absolute, but we have forgotten that. Today, there's too much, too many people are saying that, no, uh, truth is relative, and we have our own right to construe our truth. So you say global warming, I said no global warming, and my truth has to be valued as much as your truth. So this has become a huge problem in many countries, especially the one that I, I live in. Um, it's a horrendous problem because the president himself believes in false news and fake news and so forth. And so um, it's a, it's a, it could be a social problem here for a while. But again, the, the good thing is that this kind of thing promotes creativity in some way because, uh, you know, good combines with it. Mm -hmm. And then new possibilities arise and those new possibilities um, uh, are going to resonate with people and they're going to discover it and uh, will change. Well, that was my point. I think if it's sort of like a pendulum. If we have this ba uh, spate of negativity, the pendulum would swing the other way. That would be the forcing function to get the newness to come back. Right? You're totally right, and that, that's precisely what will happen. And that's precisely what did happen. You remember the 60s and 70s, you know, um, things were getting so liberalized, and we had 75% middle class in uh, our both of our countries, and now it's very different. So a pendulum has swung. Now it's swung almost to the extreme towards as more as could be. 
And now time to change, and again, huge fertility will take place, and right. quite but, sure but, will come in. But, and but isn't this isn't this sort of a, a a natural law of sorts? The 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 extremes of two sides. There isn't this a natural law. Isn't this one of the things that we just? It's an absolute. We can't deny. I think we can deny. I think it's a law of the mind. It's, yes, it's a natural law, but so long as we stick to our mind. But the age is coming when the rational mind will give way to an intuitive mind, when it does not have to be this way anymore. So I really, right. believe, I really believe that this fluctuation is a mental characteristic because mind needs that negative positive. Mind needs opposites to balance each other. But if we are beyond the mind, you know, um, feelings are quite pure, they don't need opposites. Although we say negative emotion, positive emotion, but that's because we have thrown mind. Emotion is thought plus feeling. But feelings don't have negative or positive. Feelings are quite pure. So in that sense, um, intuitions are also quite pure. It's the necessity of the mind. So, so long as you have the age of the mind, then you are right. But uh, if the next stage of the mind, uh, you know, uh, the prediction of quantum worldview is that we'll have intuitive mind, mind which gives value more to intuition than the mental processing, than rational thinking. When that happens, then we will not have so much need of this balancing. Hmm. So you don't think that the balance is, is, a necess is necessary? Uh, you don't think that that is a absolute... I don't uh, think it's an absolute necessity, necessity no. Would that, would that entail people evolving to a place where they become sort of autom automatons, you know, sort of um, robotic? Um, that no, that's the other way. Yes, the robotic is also without the mental fluctuation. So the mental is good, much better than the robotics, of course. But I think that uh, when we are intuitive, then we can give up the mechanicalness and yet don't have to depend so much on the negative uh, balancing the positive or negative combining with positive to make new potentiality. Yeah, In yeah. other words, if we are really into intuition and can live with the uncertainty of an intuitive life, then I think we can more or less live a life of positivity. Okay. Now, okay. You know, in a way, I try to live like that, and, and my success is, you know, it's a fair amount of success. I can say I'm 80% of the time happy, and uh, it does not have any negativity, and, and it's okay. It, it works. It works for me. When you, uh, one, more, one more question uh, about love. Um, when we think of the concept of love, that is something that you mentioned that we sort of just either feel or don't feel. Um, you know, it's some, sort of that magical, intangible um, characteristic that we feel when we're with, near someone. Um, is that a perceived uh, or is that learned? How does that, how does that fit into this conversation? Well, there is the learned part, which has, we certainly have brain circuits. Um, so feelings can be very much in terms of straight-jacketed feeling, uh, which many people do have, of course, you know, they're built in. Uh, but there are also feelings that we have to uh, cultivate. Uh, we have to learn. Uh, these, are the, these are called the higher chakra feelings. So uh, the, the beginning with the navel chakra, I don't know, uh, I, I think most people know about chakras, so we can talk about it. You know, these are the ideas that there are seven centers along the spine where we feel our feelings. Uh, the lowest one is in the root of the anus, and the highest one is top of the brain, neocortex. And in between, the famous one, of course, is the heart chakra. Everybody talks about the heart. What they mean is this heart chakra. Uh, similarly, there is a chakra in the navel, corresponding to the digestive organs, maintenance organs. So maintenance organ is about self-love, and the heart chakra is about loving the other. So those are the two chakras that are very, very important for us to cultivate because love, uh, feeling of love, is involved with those two chakras. So what happens if we uh, cultivate love only in the way that is built into us? It's built into us only in the way of like uh, uh, sexuality and romantic love. That's built into us. Um, but that's not the only thing we can cultivate what is called unconditional love. Love which may involve sexuality, but doesn't have to. 
And when you learn to cultivate this, then what happens is that the our condition, instead of this very selfish condition, which is always looking for transaction, what is in it for me, becomes generalized and can service the consciousness of the other in the society, service the we rather than always the I. And, um, you know, last year we talked about this. This is what economy needs right now. With not only the numero uno, but the economy needs the consideration of the other because we are destroying our environment, we're destroying our limiting resor limited resources. This has to give way to a more sustainable way of doing things in our economy. So all things considered, time has come for us to value more and more the feelings that we cultivate, that is just not built into this new love, this love for other, other than the selfish interest of getting sex from it or getting something from it for myself. Just, just love, just love for nothing. Like Mother Teresa was able to, like Gandhi was able to. Is everybody able to do that? Yes, everybody is able to do that in potentiality. Of course, you would need to have some learning before in your past lives that would have be helpful, but it's not a necessary condition. So if we develop an environment of education, you know, we are, we are going to found a um, uh, educational system, transformative educational system in London. That's the plan. Hopefully next year. By next year, it will be ready. Uh, what, is, what does it mean, transformative education? We will really teach people how to love, how to make these love circuits in the brain. We will teach people how to transform, not just transact. You know, relationships don't have to be based on what is in it for me. You scratch my back, then only I'll scratch your back. No, I'll scratch your back anyway, because it's not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, I'm curious to hear about that. That sounds fascinating to me. And I know we had a good discussion about love the last time and, and rose water and, and the essence of that. And I'm, I'm excited to hear this. I think it's a necessary and vital step in the right direction. And I encourage you uh, to do that. And I, I'm very grateful that someone is out there doing it. Let's put it that way as we certainly do need it. My guest today has been Amit Goswami. He is the author of the Everything Answer book, How Quantum Science Explains Love, Death, and the Meaning of Life. His website is The Quantum Activist. Is that correct? Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quantum Activism. And, and, and Amit Goswami.org. Oh, Goswami.org. Okay, very good. Goswami.org. Okay, very good. And that will be on the, you'll see that on the podcast as well. He's been in What the Bleep, uh, you are, what's the name of that movie you're in? What the bleeper? Where where the bleep are we? What the bleep do we know? What the bleep do we know? There we go. Thank you for correcting me. Yeah, he's also in that as well. So you be sure to check him out. Thank you so much, Ami, for a great conversation today. I really enjoyed it, and it's great to always hear your your wisdom and your perception of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to Turning of the Wheel with your host, Chris Fisher. To schedule a reading with me or to order artwork, you may visit my website at www.turningofthewheel.com. That's www.turningofthewheel.com. Or you can call me at 978-393-1036. Thank you. And as always, be open to possibilities. <laughs>